Dr. Schachter is professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School. He was the longtime executive editor of epilepsy.com. He's a board member of ETP. He is a great musician, a great friend, and um, <laughs> an exceptional person who has been a partner in building ETP, but has been involved in EF and many other efforts to help people with epilepsy over a number of years. So we're lucky to have him here today. Steve. Thank you very much. Good morning. Like Patty and Warren, I'm from Boston, so it might be almost afternoon, but uh, I know it's morning time here. It's really a pleasure to be here uh, to start the uh, Family Day, uh, and to do so, I'll be giving a, uh, a presentation that um, is based on the artwork of people with epilepsy that speaks to the many different challenges um, and experiences that people with epilepsy and their family have, and hopefully um, some of those will resonate with those of you who uh, have epilepsy or uh, live with individuals with epilepsy, and also hopefully it will help set the stage for the talks that follow. <clears throat> and what I uh, hope to do is to touch on some of the day-to-day -day issues that uh, are, um, uh, that often occur, and to illustrate these through the art of people who themselves have struggled uh, with those issues and who through their art um, are expressing that uh, struggle and that challenge. And in the spirit of um, the epilepsy pipeline meeting, my other hope is that these that by illustrating, literally illustrating these challenges, that we can help influence the community and also influence the researchers who are in a position to um, take action and to uh, solve these challenges um, through their work. And I chose to um, focus on several specific aspects of day-to-day -day life with epilepsy, um, the effect on mood, impact on parents who have a child with epilepsy, uh, daily reminders and experiences of living with seizures and living with the diagnosis of epilepsy in between seizures, and then concluding with um, art that illustrates the potential uh, for creativity and expression and uh, individual uh, achievement um, in leading a fulfilling life. Now, the art that I'll be showing um, emanated out of an uh, art show in Boston that was held <clears throat> in the early 90s. Uh, the um, show was organized by a patient of mine at the time in Boston who owned an art gallery in downtown Boston. And she had met a number of other artists with epilepsy over the years, and they had a support group where they uh, met and talked about um, what life was like for them with epilepsy, and <clears throat> the idea came to them to have a show and uh, I, for the public, and I was happy to support that, and it was called From the Storm, and that show then, uh, with the support of a lot of organizations and individuals, went on, a road, on the road, went on a tour through the, the U.S., through Canada, and ultimately to um, Sydney, Australia in 1995. And over the course of that time, my um, interaction with the artist grew and developed. And um, long story short, I now have over 1,300 art pieces um, in um, various forms, many of them digital files, from over 60 artists from around the world. And uh, just today, I got another two emails with uh, attachments. And they're great, except these attachments tend to be pretty large. Uh -huh. <laughs> so they send me to email jail quite often, um, but it's, it's fantastic, and I try to utilize this art uh, not only for talks like this, but uh, for covers of books or covers of um, journal articles, um, because I think it helps um, 
you know, in a nonverbal way, communicate so much that's important um, about uh, living with epilepsy. So uh, the first topic then, mood disorders. Um, how are depression and epilepsy related, and does depression affect the lives of persons with epilepsy, and if so, how? This is a topic that is um, increasingly um, being studied by the scientific community, uh, but it's one, frankly, that uh, was uh, overlooked I, I, you know, for a number of years uh, or dismissed uh, by the medical profession. Um, but I'm pleased to say that it's now being taken quite, quite seriously, and it's being recognized. In fact, uh, it was Hippocrates many centuries ago who uh, first published um, the recognition in his writings that the relationship between depression and epilepsy move both ways so that depression could then lead to epilepsy and epilepsy certainly could lead to depression and modern studies have confirmed that which is important because now we're trying to understand what how could depression lead to epilepsy what could be the common biological basis to that and we through these studies have learned that depression uh, occurs in up to half of people with epilepsy, particularly those whose seizures are not responding to medication, and also in a fair number of people with epilepsy whose seizures are well controlled, and more than uh, is the case for the general population. And <clears throat> yet despite these recent studies, I think still um, in practice, in office practice and the care of people with epilepsy, depression continues to be under-recognized and under-treated. And a lot of the art that, has, that I've collected over the years and um, that has been sent to me um, speaks to the uh, mood of the individual. This is a self-portrait of an artist from Florida, um, very obviously uh, showing sadness and depression. Also, the um, rapid, relatively rapid transition from uh, depression to elation, or you know, the the um, fluctuation of mood, uh, which I think you can see in this particular painting as well, from anger to sadness to happiness. And um, what we're what we're learning through research is that the symptoms of depression experienced by people with epilepsy is not exactly the same as depression in people who don't have epilepsy. And we're trying to learn more about that and understand why that is. And uh, undoubtedly, there's um, some uh, neurological basis to that. And I think, as is the case for epilepsy, when we can figure it out, then we would be able to come up with treatments that are more likely to be effective. Another um, mood disorder that's commonly uh, experienced by people with epilepsy is anxiety and a sense of anxiousness and worry and concern, uh, whether it's when is the next seizure going to occur or it, uh, there may not be anything that it's, a person can put their finger on as to why they're feeling so anxious. But this individual is um, wrote, and much of the art, I should say, too, comes with um, stories uh, and um, explanations by the artist, what they were experiencing that they tried to depict in their art. And this person said that at times he feels like he's in front of an oncoming train uh, with nowhere to escape. And <clears throat> sometimes these feelings may occur as the manifestation of the seizure itself or after the seizure or in between seizures. But um, it is something for you or your family member to bring to the attention of, of your neurologist if um, you are experiencing this as well. Impact on parents. Uh, what is the impact? We've heard Warren poignantly uh, talk about his um, introduction to epilepsy. And the first time you, your child has a seizure, or that you see your child has a seizure, is something obviously you can never forget. And the impact of living then with a, a child, your child with epilepsy, is, is quite significant. And uh, the scientific community has begun to look at this as well. And um, we know that parents who watch their child have the seizure for the first time 
and have no previous experience with epilepsy to know at that moment what's going on, often um, believe at that moment the child is dying and, uh, or will die, that there's something um, so horrendously wrong that the child is going to die. And that, the impact of that, relatively short, but at the time seemingly forever experience, can last years and years and years and cause symptoms that um, we might call a form of post-traumatic stress disorder. And <clears throat> um, struggling with the, the um, fear and the uh, uncertainty of a child with epilepsy can, in the parents, lead to depression and um, alter parenting styles in ways that may or may not you know, be in the child's best interest growing up, um, concerns about how to navigate the healthcare system, which is fragmented as we know and not conducive for um, a chronic disorder like epilepsy, um, being your child's advocate at school, at church, um, at the playground, at home, you know, and how this impacts on not only the parents but on siblings and the extended family. And um, the impact on parents was recognized centuries ago. Um, this is a, uh, a very small part of a painting by Peter Paul Rubens, a Flemish painter. The date of this painting is uh, around 1600 or so. And it's based on a story from the New Testament. Um, and uh, Patty and I are from a hospital with Jewish roots, but once we uh, merged with the Deaconess Hospital, I could finally start talking about the, uh, <laughs> the New Testament. <laughs> and um, if you open up um, Gideon's Bible in your uh, hotel room, there's a story in there in three different locations. Uh, I think it's in Matthew, Luke, and Mark describing a father who brings his son to Jesus because the child has, epilepsy, has seizures. And um, it's an interesting um, story to read because Jesus, well, first of all, the um, father had brought his child to the disciples to be cured. And at that time in history, epilepsy was thought to have a divine or a... Uh, you know, a supernatural cause. So it would make sense in light of that theory that the treatment would be, uh, would be rendered by somebody with a connection to the supernatural. Or, and so the, the disciples couldn't help the child. And so um, today we would call it getting a second opinion. <laughs> um, the father came to Jesus and, and Jesus asked the father to describe a seizure. And the father does. And you know, how he, and then the child then has a seizure in the story and uh, is laying motionless once the convulsion ends and then Jesus casts out the evil spirit and other paintings of this scene show uh, like a cloud leaving the child's lips and the child wakes up and theologically that was taken as a sign that Jesus awoke the child from the dead and uh, as a you know, as evidence of his divineness. So the paintings of this scene are called Transfiguration. And <clears throat> um, then, from a medical standpoint, the interesting uh, conversation that followed was Jesus recommends two things. Prayer, and I think we have yet to fully understand the impact of prayer, and fasting. And we know today that fasting is, the first, is often the first step uh, in the ketogenic diet. Anyways, I digress. So, but this this painting by Rubens, uh, I think, is remarkable. Uh, as I say, from the year 1600. And look at the parents. Um, just the, the the expression of fear and helplessness as the child is in the midst of a seizure here, and it happens to be a very accurately portrayed seizure. So, whoever painted the child had, uh, I would guess, had seen a child with epilepsy, you have a number of seizures to remember this number of details to be able to paint the skin color, the posture, the saliva, the ID, you know, the various sort of clinical aspects of this. But I think it's a, you know, really insightful portrayal too of the, the parents um, who are experiencing this along with their son. 
<clears throat> and, uh, you know, sadly and tragically, um, sometimes the parental fear that a child may die comes true. And this painting is called Anna Katrina uh, Ascending to Heaven. Anna Katrina was the daughter of uh, a well-known American artist uh, named Leonard Lear, who Warren knows quite well, and <clears throat> was in Chicago and now is in Texas. And his daughter, Anna Katrina, uh, died from complications of status. And this um, painting um, just captures so much of the angst and um, horror of... Um, losing a child to epilepsy. You can see the EEG in the blue uh, and Anna Katrina in bed and quite a bit of, of Leonard's artwork um, uh, is our portrayals of Anna Katrina when she was in a chronic vegetative state before she, she passed. And the hand that's in the middle at the bottom there is, is Anna Katrina's hand when she was in a, a persistent vegetative state. And I have this um, particular... I have a, an original print that Leonard sent me behind my desk in my office. And for me, this is a um, you know, daily reminder of what, we, what our task is and what we have to do. Um, death can occur in a number of ways from epilepsy, including drowning. And Trish, are you here? I think I saw you coming in before. Trish Barnes uh, lost her son, Kevin to a drowning accident around 10 years ago. Um, he would have turned 27 a couple months ago. And um, Trish makes these wonderful pyramids and um, hopes to use them to raise money for epilepsy research. And um, uh, I know that this is very uncomfortable for Trish now, so if we could all just show her our appreciation for what she has done. Now, moving on then to the third topic, living with epilepsy, living with um, the consequences of the diagnosis itself. Um, how pervasive, how impactful is the stigma, is the um, experience of living with epilepsy in between seizures in our society? And <clears throat> this, too, is a to research topic that is increasingly being studied um, using um, methods from the social sciences, uh, and it's clear from this research that this is a very large uh, and common problem and that it impacts the individual with epilepsy in ways that are numerous and often, um, counter uh, often um, negative. This one particular study looked at over 5,000 people with epilepsy in Europe and over half of them felt stigmatized by their epilepsy, and these were in developed countries. And whether a person with epilepsy believes others view them differently and negatively, or whether they, other people actually do treat them negatively, it can impact the day-to-day -day lives of people with epilepsy in ways that can keep a person back from being successful in life and even increasing stress levels to the point of causing seizures. And a lot of the art that um, I have illustrates the stigma, the um, sense of feeling different, the person with epilepsy feeling different, feeling isolated, feeling alone, even with other people around them, feeling below the level of society. Um, this particular uh, watercolor shows this in very stark ways uh, the day in the life of somebody with epilepsy from um, sunrise to sunset with the moon in the background and you see no one in this, you see no other people in this, it's a very lonely day. Um, the cracks in the um, path represent the gaps of time of the seizures that this individual has. Again, feeling alone, um, uh, many people uh, may feel least alone in their own home. Uh, this uh, individual, again, you know, the only one in the landscape of this particular um, drawing. Um, 
a bedroom being a, the most comfortable place, perhaps the most, the least threatening place for somebody with, who feels stigmatized to, to be. Um, the physicians in the audience might um, uh, resonate with the experiences that we have, which is that you may see somebody with epilepsy as a patient and clinically they're doing well, and so you say, well, it's no longer necessary for you to come every month or every two months or whatever. Um, in fact, you can maybe go back to the referring physician or I'll see you in a year or something like that. And they'll say, no, we want to come back in a month or two. You know, we, we, um, they feel validated and accepted and uh, as people in, with you, and uh, it may be one of the very few social contexts that they do, and they would rather not give it up you know, if they don't have to. This photograph is a very powerful um, illustration of a concept called perceived stigma. So <clears throat> um, if a person with epilepsy is applying for a job and they say, by the way, I have seizures, and then they're not hired, that we call enacted stigma. That Actually, there was something somebody else did um, to that individual with epilepsy that uh, was inappropriate. Um, Perceived stigma means that um, you, the person with epilepsy, believe you're reading the mind of somebody around you and believing that they're thinking at that moment, though, you have epilepsy and therefore you are, you know, inferior in some way. Or that. And that perception can be as disabling or life-limiting as enacted stigma. And this artist set up this scene to illustrate this concept of perceived stigma. Here we have the clown, person dressed like a clown. That's the individual with epilepsy. And he thinks that people in this in, um, social environment, this um, busy, crowded scene, that they're looking at him and thinking, oh, he's a clown, or he's a, you know, he has epilepsy, therefore he's something different. He's... Yeah, yeah, we're, we're stigmatizing him. And he thinks that he looks like a clown to the other people. But when you look at the people around him, none of them are actually looking at him. They're going about their daily lives. And so this sense of being different is in his mind and keeping himself back in some way. So the, the perceived stigma can be, can be something that is um, very uh, disabling, perhaps, for some people with epilepsy day in and day out. Of course, what, what reinforces the sense of being different, being less than perfect or, or you know, inferior in some way, can be the daily reminders associated with epilepsy, like the pill bottle. You know, and children who have to leave the classroom to take a middle-of-the-day dose of their seizure medication you know, have to get up in front of their classmates, you know, go to the nurse's station, come back, and you know, that's these very visible, you know, um, uh, daily uh, reminders can reinforce the sense of being different. The side effects associated with medication. Warren talked about, you know, the side effects which um, can, even in the face of being free of seizures, can nonetheless um, interfere with life. And, you know, physicians may ask the questions, are you having side effects? And yeah, I'm happy, but not really focus in on what it means to have side effects and how you know, some people are in a way forced to endure side effects in order to be seizure free or to have the fewest number of seizures possible. And this uh, is an artist from Minnesota who I met when I came up to the Twin City area uh, in the Warners here. And this is a, a fantastic art show and we met this artist and you know, it gives you a sense um, of what double vision is like, and double vision is a very common side effect of medication. But you know, imagine, and many of you probably have had double vision. It's it's um, difficult, you know, and that's just one of many many side effects. <clears throat> Here's a couple of Rubik's cubes, and the, the point here is that you know, like you, uh, I don't know how many thousands of different combinations of Rubik, you know. Um, settings there are is you twist a Rubik's cube, but the point here is each, each face of each cube has a different uh, daily experience 
associated with epilepsy and some have nothing to do with epilepsy. But the message here by the artist Jim Chambliss uh, is that from day to day, you know, it's going to be some new combination of experiences. That the reality for that person is going to be some combination. And the question is, you know, who's in control of that? And often people with epilepsy feel that they're not in control of that. As we move into the new era of medical devices and technology that is going to be um, surgically implanted into people, um, there's a concern. This is another artist from Minnesota. The concern that, you know, am I turning into some sort of, you know, um, uh, machine? Or, I mean, to what extent is, uh, is my daily existence dependent on computers and technology and this is a self-portrait of the individual imagining in the future to what extent her daily existence will be dependent on technology. Um, of course, waking up from a seizure, uh, as is the artist in this uh, painting, looking up as people look down at you literally and figuratively, um, can, uh, over time, you know, create a sense of who you are relative to other people, feeling below other people, or feeling like people are looking down at you. And even though these three people probably mean well and are going to help the individual, still the dynamics of this interpersonal relationship, um, I think, feed into the sense of perceived stigma that um, and lack of control that some people with epilepsy may experience. You know, and that feeling that you're just one moment away from um, uh, drowning in this particular, you know, and that you can, the message here is that if she has a seizure and the, that what she's clinging to, that wire, which is her EEG, turns into a seizure, with the spike discharges, she'll have to let go and, and, um, with the consequence you can imagine. And feeling below the level of society, uh, this is a portrait of St. Valentine, who is one of the patron saints of epilepsy. <clears throat> and here are the people with epilepsy reaching up from below the surface of uh, the road, wanting to be brought up into mainstream uh, society. And finally, um, is it, is it possible for people with epilepsy to live to their full potential? And that, that should, of course, be our goal with medical help, is to enable people with epilepsy to live to their full potential. Is that possible and to lead a happy and fulfilling life? And I'll close with uh, some artwork that, um, to me anyways, doesn't seem to have any direct connection to seizures or side effects or stigma, but rather celebrates the um, wonderful abilities uh, and creativity of people, some artists who have, who have epilepsy, and you know, um, who through their work remind us that in spite of the challenges that they face, that they are um, productive, uh, creative, uh, people who um, uh, contribute to society, to um, the beauty of life, uh, to help us realize what the human spirit is capable of in the face of, of significant challenges. This is a, a, a quilt, not that you would put it on your bed, but it's a quilt made from Coke cans. Um, and I, I, of course, I know many of these artists. This is a professor at um, an art school in New York City who drew that. Um, here's some fantasy art. Jim Chambliss, who I mentioned earlier, has also, uh, he did a master's thesis and a PhD in uh, the art of epilepsy and has gathered a lot of art himself as well. I saw this piece on a recent trip to China. Um, in Nanjing, China, there was a little art exhibit by some patients in that local area. This is, uh, if anyone's an art historian, you might recognize this as Di Chirico, an Italian artist, 
uh, he had epilepsy. He's considered the father of surrealism. And at a meeting in Rome a couple months ago, um, Jim and I were privileged to go to his studio, to the Chirico studio, and, and have sort of free reign of the whole uh, studio, looking through a lot of his art. Some vibrant watercolors. Um, I was telling Dan Lowenstein earlier, this particular artist uh, is largely bedridden from a stroke um, some 20 or 25 years ago. Uh, and you would never know that from his work, which is so uh, vibrant and full of life. Incidentally, if anyone is interested in learning more about the artists uh, behind the art, I'm more than happy to put you in touch with them. These are all folks who have encouraged me and allowed me to show their work in talks like this. But uh, in a book that I put out of art called Visions, we have all the contact information for the artists in the back, and many have wound up selling works to help support themselves um, through that exposure. <clears throat> I had this original. It's really quite spectacular. He had, uh, the artist here is the uh, gentleman, and he had a temporal lobectomy. Uh, and this is um, a few months after that. Actually, more than a few months, because obviously his hair has grown back. <laughs> a woman who, um, with epilepsy, who had uh, trouble conceiving and eventually became pregnant and had a beautiful, healthy baby. So, um, you know, to set the stage for the... Um, the day, I think, the art and in some other context, the music of people living with epilepsy um, inspires us in many ways, uh, particularly to more completely understand if we're not personally involved ourselves, uh, the day-to-day -day impact of epilepsy. And the, the, uh, at the same time, you know, the, 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 um, uh, the uh, possibility of achieving and enabling somebody to live to their full potential. So for the research community here, I think, you know, that this should uh, encourage us to press on, to increase and accelerate the research that we do, to help us focus the research so that the um, fruits of that research someday soon will help people with epilepsy to live to their full potential free of not only the seizures but also the psychosocial consequences of epilepsy that were um, illustrated in some of the work that I showed. So to finish then I just want to thank of course the artists whose work I showed, uh, my colleagues and each of you in the audience who have epilepsy, who live with epilepsy, who in inspire all of us here to do more every day. Thank you.